Hello everybody and welcome to History Bite number 225, dated April 6th, 2021. I'm Walter, your mobile historian and blue collar scholar. This History Bite is entitled, The Negro Seamen Acts. The Negro Seamen Acts were punitive maritime laws enacted first in the state of South Carolina and then later by virtually every other southern state that required uh, free black men on vessels that docked in South Carolina's ports okay, to be jailed for the duration of the vessel's stay in port in South Carolina. When it was time for the vessel to leave, the captain of the vessel had to pay the costs of incarceration for however many black crewmen had to be jailed during the time the vessel was in port. If the captain could not pay or refused to pay or forgot the black sailors, none of these situations were common. All right, captain virtually always uh, came back to collect his crewmen, all right? If, if any of those situations applied, then the imprisoned uh, African-American men could be sold into slavery, regardless of whether or not this person had ever been a slave a day in their lives. All right. Now, the purpose and motive behind these punitive laws, like I said, first enacted in South Carolina and then uh, virtually all the other southern states and, you know, more subtly in some northern states, too, uh, was to prevent the interaction uh, between free blacks and enslaved ones, okay? South Carolina's motive came largely due to the discovery of the attempted slave revolt planned by uh, the legendary Denmark Vesey, all right? And to prevent uh, people like Vesey from conjuring up any future uh, slave revolts in the state, South Carolina felt it would be in the best interests of the public policy of the state to prevent any interaction between free blacks and enslaved ones uh, coming from out of state, all right? So in this case, free blacks arriving in the state on vessels, all right? So South Carolina required these free black sailors to be imprisoned while the vessel was in port in the state, all right? There were no exceptions to this rule, okay? Now, like I said, if the captain uh, left without them or refused to pay or couldn't pay, the men could be sold into slavery, all right? Now, after the enactment of these laws in 1822, the first party to put up a stink about them was Great Britain, all right? Reason being, quite obviously, that the British... Uh, Maritime fleet was enormous and it employed a considerable amount of black people, all right, on its vessels. And the British were like, the hell? You, you're going to imprison our crewmen. You're going to imprison our crewmen. And then accordingly, we're going to have to pay a fee to get them out of jail while we're here docked in your ports. You know, and the British were very, 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 uh, you know, opposed to these laws and even uh, complained to the United States government about them. And, you know, uh, at this time, I said, this is 1822, uh, 1823. And Secretary of State John Quincy Adams, you know, assured the British that we're going to do something about this. If South Carolina continues to do this, you know, we're going to take appropriate action. Uh, yeah, we'll see. All right. Interestingly enough, all right, that brings us to the good part. In 1823, U.S. Supreme Court Justice William Johnson, all right, ironically, a Jefferson appointee uh, from South Carolina, who was certainly a believer in states' rights, declared the law to be unconstitutional. Yeah, this is a South Carolina jurist, all right, born and raised there, all right, a Jefferson appointee on the U.S. Supreme Court sitting in circuit duty, on circuit duty in his own state, declared the law unconstitutional, all right, the case is Elkison versus Deliesaline, all right, Elkison versus uh, 
Deliesling, rather, all right, uh, 1823. Justice Johnson, you know, held these laws to be draconian in their nature, very unjust, very inhumane, uh, and in violation of Congress's power to regulate commerce, all right? Needless to say, in South Carolina, Johnson's opinion was very unpopular, all right? Now, the state of South Carolina didn't break its neck to enforce this law, but in the city of Charleston, you know, there were a lot of local citizens groups who made damn sure that the law was enforced, all right? After all, Charleston was the state's largest port and the avenue by which the most trouble could come from free colored seamen, all right, free colored sailors instigating problems amongst the enslaved blacks of the state, all right? So like I said, Johnson's opinion was not popular, all right, newspapers wouldn't publish it, so indeed he had to take care of the publication himself, and it essentially led to a lot of back and forth between, you know, common commentators in the state on the validity of his opinion, all right? Whether he realized it or not, Justice Johnson had indirectly raised the difficult question on whether or not free blacks had any national rights that could overrule state laws governing the domestic tranquility and welfare of their citizens. All right. You know, interestingly enough, other members of the U.S. Supreme Court, including Chief Justice John Marshall and Associate Justice Joseph Story, all right, had faced challenges to these laws while sitting on circuit duty in their own respective states, Virginia and Massachusetts. Both men, both men, but more so Chief Justice John Marshall, uh, had uh, faced these challenges, but not with the boldness of Justice Johnson. Johnson was the only member of the court who was bold enough to declare the law unconstitutional in South Carolina. Chief Justice Marshall avoided the question um, entirely, uh, dismissing the case on technicality when it was brought to him while sitting on duty in Virginia. And how uh, precisely uh, the rationale used by Justice Story uh, when the matter uh, was likely brought to him in Massachusetts, which also had similar quarantine laws, the exact result is um, unknown. But what is assured is that he did not declare it to be unconstitutional, okay? So, you know, with all the unpopular fanfare and so forth and so on, you know, Justice Johnson would write to Secretary of State Adams, essentially calling for the intervention of President James Monroe to uh, do something about this, you know. So President Monroe would ask his Attorney General William Wirt to evaluate the law and, and basically tell me, sir, is it constitutional? Attorney General Wirt came out very quickly and said, Mr. President, the law is unconstitutional in its entirety as it violates commercial treaties between the U.S. and Britain, all right? So we've got President Monroe thinking it's unconstitutional. Secretary of State John, uh, John Quincy Adams thinks it's unconstitutional as well as Attorney General William Wirt. <clears throat> Okay, so President Monroe sent a copy of Attorney General Wirt's letter to uh, the governor of South Carolina uh, in 1824, you know, who met it with resistance. You know, who the hell do you people think you are telling us our, our law here in South Carolina is unconstitutional? You lost your daggone mind. Mm. In any case... The uh, governor sent the matter to the legislature, uh, which responded even more harshly than the governor. All right. The Senate really rebuked the federal government and House of Representatives in South Carolina uh, took a more appropriate tone in just holding that state of South Carolina had this power naturally to regulate uh, and protect its own domestic security from threats. All right. Yeah, okay, fine. So, in any case, the situation remained unchanged at this point and remained largely unchanged in the presidency of John Quincy Adams, which followed that of President Monroe, okay? 
Uh, that did not, however, stop uh, the British from continuing to protest to Washington about the unconstitutionality and absolute unacceptability of these laws. However, Britain eventually kept quiet about the matter as President John Quincy Adams told them, yeah, yeah, we're, 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 we're on it. We're doing something about it. Uh, yeah, even though nothing much was really happening. Okay? But Adams was able to keep the British calm, you know, which wasn't an easy task. I mean, naval strength, they could have whipped our tails at that point. It, it would not have been a pretty thing, but that's for another video. In any case, when Andrew Jackson became president in 1829, okay, the whole attitude of the federal government changed on these laws. Jackson, who was himself a southerner and slave owner, referred the matter to his own attorney generals when he became president. Uh, after the British kept, you know, yo, yo, I already told you guys about this. We are tired of you impressing our black sailors, all right? So then, you know, Jackson gives the matter to his attorney generals. Y'all come in here and tell me, is this law constitutional? I'm quite sick of these British getting on my nerves about this. So Jackson's attorney generals both tell him, especially Roger B. Taney, who would later, of course, become what? Chief Justice of the United States in 1836. Roger B. Taney had the opinion, quite simply, okay, that these laws were perfectly within a state's police power to do. How a state treated its black citizens was no business of the federal government whatsoever, and that the executive and the judiciary should frankly stay out of it, okay? Regardless of what the justices of the Supreme Court might say about it, this is a matter for the people of the states to decide. Wonder if he would have felt that way if an attorney general had rebuked him like that when he was chief justice and that the Supreme Court really carries no water here. Hmm, don't think he would have met it with a smile. One reason the Supreme Court never addressed the constitutionality of these laws, folks, was because the imprisoned sailors were already freed well before the matter could work its way up through the court system. So the Supreme Court never had the ability to address the issue. All right. Justice Johnson's opinion essentially uh, unleashed a 20 year firestorm uh, in the country on the legitimacy of these laws. And it would not be arguably until 1842 when uh, Congress would give it its attention, hoping to uh, give some sort of finality to the matter. Though, you know, that was not exactly the case. All right. So in 1842, a petition was brought uh, in the House of uh, Representatives uh, from the owners and masters of vessels in Boston, you know, who sought congressional relief from the law. I mean, we're sick and tired of, you know, South Carolina uh, and other southern states uh, imprisoning their black sailors and then they having to pay costs to get them out, all right? So the chairman of the Commerce Committee, all right, used the opportunity to produce a report on the laws, all right? And that, of course, drew, that was the majority report, and that, of course, drew a minority uh, report, all right? The majority report, known as the Winthrop Report, uh, held that the laws violated the Privileges and Immunities Clause of Article 4 of the Constitution, all right? And that, essentially, the states had no such power to do this, all right, in, in confining an entire class of citizens in this discriminatory manner. All right, obviously a very northern and progressive opinion. The minority port, known as the Rayner Report, held a very different view, needless to say. All right, they held that laws did not violate the federal constitution as they did not in any way infringe on any existing act of Congress. All right, uh, regulating commerce. Mm -hmm. Nor in any way, shape, or form did the states in ratifying the Constitution and giving Congress the power to regulate commerce, uh, states didn't give up their right to preserve domestic tranquility uh, and peace uh, between their citizens in their states, all right? States retain the power to maintain the health, welfare, safety, and domestic tranquility 
of their people and all such laws that were necessary to do that as long as they did not violate the Constitution directly in any way were perfectly constitutional. The Minority Report also raised a very good point that even I'll concede that the Majority Report was holding that uh, the law should be uh, overturned, essentially invalidated, struck down, all right, that the only relief essentially could come from the courts, which was appropriate. The majority report saying that only the judiciary could invalidate these laws, uh, which was only half true. But the minority report uh, held that the petitioners themselves, in wanting Congress to pass a law via the Privileges uh, and Immunities Clause, all right, could actually hurt their cause more than help it, as the other side could ask for the same thing. The anti, <clears throat> excuse me, the folks opposed to the law obviously wanted Congress to pass a statute that would have the effect of rendering the South Carolina law unconstitutional, all right, because it would have required South Carolina to treat it's black and white citizens virtually the same way they did in Massachusetts, which was a, to a much greater degree of equality than in South Carolina. Now, the Minority Report said, you know, guys, don't you realize how that could be used against you? And they could ask Congress to pass a law requiring that Massachusetts allow slaveholders to take their slaves out of the state. All right. Just as easy as they bought them in there. Now, we haven't gotten involved, okay? We've left this to you guys to deal with, all right? So you better be careful when you ask Congress to intervene because just as you guys are asking us to make South Carolina treat its black and white citizens with some sort of uh, equality here, South Carolina could easily uh, ask us to uh, force Massachusetts to not automatically free your slaves when... Uh, they bring them in when you guys bring them into Massachusetts, but instead you, you, um, they could always ask for us to make Massachusetts give them their slaves back, all right, or allow their slaves to remain slaves while in the state of Massachusetts, and then allow them to take them out just as easily as they brought them in, all right. So, frankly, you'd better handle this on your own. Because your argument could lead to a further uh, reduction in your ability to negotiate here. Just as you guys are asking for this, they could ask for it too. And then what do you have? Your cause will be even weaker than what it was when you began it. All right. So those were the two reports generated uh, when Congress did finally uh, give any attention to the subject at all. Okay. Now, that for the most part, you know, quieted the matter for the interim for about the next uh, 20 or so years. Uh, and during the American Civil War, the laws essentially uh, ceased in operation with the northern blockade of southern ports. All right. And with the adoption of the 13th Amendment in 1865, the laws would have effectively served no more purpose as slavery was, of course, abolished by that, by that amendment and all would be therefore free, no longer requiring anyone to be imprisoned to affect, to uh, have any um, effects whatsoever on the local slave population because there was no more local slave population. All right. So the laws essentially continued uh, in their existence and enforcement up until the uh, conclusion of the American Civil War and would essentially be uh, invalidated in form and purpose with the adoption of the 13th Amendment in 1865. So those are the Colored Seamen Acts, folks, that were in effect from 1822 largely until 1865 when they would be nullified by the 13th Amendment. All right. Any questions or controversies, leave them down below. I'll be happy to answer them. If you have not subscribed to my YouTube channel, please do so now. I greatly appreciate it. 
Thanks for listening. Hope you learned something from this. If you enjoyed this video, drop me a like. That would be graciously appreciated. Take care. Stay safe out there. And I'll talk to you at the next bite. Peace.